Okay, so you find, because now we've, we're going to screen everybody, you find millions of folks with type 2 diabetes. Are there non-pharmacologic approaches that you try first? Is that, was that where you go first? There is no denying the fact that even if you need pharmacological agents, you still got to think about lifestyle. It's all about lifestyle when it comes to type 2 diabetes, with rare exceptions. I mean, there are people whose beta cells are failing faster than the others, but the vast majority of people with type 2 diabetes would not require as many medications as we use right now if they followed the lifestyle, which means modest attention to diet and modest exercise on a daily basis, at least five days a week. Can you, given what you were telling me, supposing we get a very motivated patient and he or she goes to the gym five days a week, right, loses seven to 10% body weight, what percent of all those people will stay off meds? Well, if you look at the DPP, the Diabetes Prevention Program that Arm just mentioned, what happened in that study is that 58% of people were able to prevent the progression of diabetes. Not 100, but 58 is a huge number. So sooner or later, people will, if they are genetically programmed and if they have all the other risk factors, they will progress to diabetes. But what we're trying to do is to forestall the development of diabetes. And if we can do it for five years, for a decade or longer, this is a time that's actually very precious because it's preventing people from going on to needing more and more therapies. I know when you talk to somebody and you give them that initial diagnosis, you've got diabetes, there's a moment of panic, isn't there? It's, oh my gosh, this is a terrible sure, thing. Yeah, many people get uh, very concerned that they have to do something for the rest of their life. And it's true, they and do. And then, and of course, they need some encouragement. You need to sit down with them, spend a few minutes, talk to them and see if they need to meet with a nutritionist or exercise physiologist. Not everybody has to do that at great length, but dietitian, I would say yes, at the time of diagnosis of diabetes. And I think they need to understand that it's not only going to help their diabetes control, but it'll help further down the complications, particularly cardiovascular complications, which play the most major havoc. All right, let's, let's go diabetes. back to guidelines for a minute. Yeah. We've got the ADA, mm -hmm. the AACE, they've got guidelines. What do they recommend for optimal glycemic control? Well, they have different what does recommendations. That mean, by the way? It They're means different. different things I knew to different this. people, of course. Why make it easy, right? So ACE recommends as a goal a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5, and the ADA recommends a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7. However, both of those organizations have some caveats that treatment has to be individualized, and the goals of therapy also need to be individualized. Let me stop you just for a minute, because you said pre-diabetes was in... A1C less than 5.5, uh, more than 5.5. But here you're telling me the recommendation for diabetics, that number is higher than 5.5. That's correct. So you never, if you follow these guidelines, get somebody with diabetes down to somebody who's already diagnosed with pre-diabetes. Well, if we can bring them down to the pre-diabetic range, so more, more power to us and more power to the patient. But it's not appropriate for every patient. For instance, elderly people, people with limited life expectancy, we are not trying to bring down their levels to the fives or even lower sixes. Why is that? Because of hypoglycemia. Ah. And hypoglycemia is a major, major concern for people with diabetes. There was a period in this country, I guess the Jocelyn Clinic was one of the leading advocators of this for very tight glycemic control. And I don't hear that from you. Was that because people were getting into trouble from hypoglycemia? Exactly right. That's one of the major concerns. And also what the ADA and ACE have come to the conclusion is that we don't treat everybody to the same standards. So we are not going to treat as aggressively a 70 or 80 year old person with limited life expectancy because they may have a malignancy. They may have, I'm not going to worry about 40 years hence in terms of complications as opposed to somebody who is 40. I'm only smiling because it's the 60s. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. I think part of the problem was in the past, you know, when diet didn't work, the only medications we had caused hypoglycemia. Right. And now we have so many other choices. I'm sure you'll come to that later sure. on in our discussion. But the point is that if I develop diabetes today, and if I could, I would like to be as close to normal A1C as possible. Sure. Why not? Why not? Now, as, what are the of course, the only exception is, of course, as Helena said, Older people, by older I mean, <laughs> not chronologically, 
but biologically. I That's like fine. him so <laughs> much. <laughs> like him so if, you like you have, <laughs> if you have advanced renal disease, let's say, yeah. or a history of stroke, obviously I'm not going to shoot for A1C, let alone 6.5, not even 7%, and we have guidelines for that. Up to 7.5 is acceptable, even 8% mm -hmm. in some people. It all depends. So I think now we're becoming wiser in our approach because we have so many better tools than we used to have before. Let me, before we even leave this, ask the question, I, I was sort of skating around this by saying it's hard. What percent of people follow your advice? Lose that 7%, go to the gym five days a week? Well, I have to admit, I haven't been very successful. I try my very best, I spend a lot of time. My dietitian spends a lot of time with our patients. There is a lot of hand-holding in my practice, if you will. How successful am I? Well, if I'm successful, half of the time I consider myself ahead. But 50% is a lot, yes, actually. Yes, I another consider big myself number. ahead, I think that's great. And let me get, so that we don't let doctors off the hook, what percent of all doctors follow the guidelines? I mean, it's one thing to say to the patients, it's your fault, but are the docs doing what they're supposed to do? Well, uh, I think, you know, uh, people do look at guidelines, but I think, again, it, you got to individualize patients. Even the guidelines say that you got to individualize the treatment. So I think in the, the point is that we need to get our patients to at least, uh, you know, meet us halfway. And I tell my patients that even if you don't lose any weight, don't worry about it initially. As long as you're exercising, you're making yourself more insulin sensitive okay. and you will need less medication. So you give them something to hold on to. You've got to. to meet them halfway. Okay. But I again, do the same that yeah. um, does. Okay. It's negotiation. But you, 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 you let the docs off the hook because in order to get to that point, the doc has to know the guidelines and at least try to implement it. And are docs doing a good job of this or not? I think they try. I think there are two things. You, you're alluding to two very important things. One is what's called clinical inertia, yeah. which basically means that, you know, you don't want to keep adding medications. Patients come and pleads with you, doc, give me a few more weeks and I'll show you. I can do better. Right. And the next appointment is canceled because the patient doesn't want to disappoint the doctor, right? right? So this is human. So I think that's one part of the problem. The other part is the patient's side where there may be some adherence issues, cost, of the drugs, um, not wanting to exercise all the time because they can't have fine time, or they are not. They need some more motivation, and uh, you know it's a, it's a lifelong process uh, with diet. And there are too many opportunities uh, to indulge oneself in our lifestyle. <laughs> so this is all part of the equation. So, but adherence to treatment also includes taking your drugs properly every day. And you know, patient with type two diabetes in particular is a good example. An average patient takes like eight or nine drugs a day, something for blood cholesterol, something for hypertension, two or three drugs for diabetes, sometimes two drugs for lipids. So it all adds up, and they need to be reminded and educated why these drugs are important. It's tricky, because as you yeah. get older, your ability to remember to take all these drugs yeah. gets cognitive, impaired sometimes. Cognitive issues are also And important. the diabetics are associated yeah. with cognitive deficiencies too. Yeah. And we're piling on stuff, right?